Good evening. Um, this is a once a year opportunity for the superintendent. I usually don't get to welcome people to the board meeting and leave that to the capable hands of the members of the school committee. However, tonight they gave me the gavel for one second. And the purpose of this <laughs> was a nice lady like uh, Tam. The purpose is that uh, by uh, charter, the school board meets on Monday with the town council and either uh, new or re-elected, as it was this case, uh, members of the board are duly sworn in. And then we are under uh, charter again, uh, requested to meet uh, at the same evening, on the same evening, and uh, the school committee elects its chair. So it's my pleasure to do two things tonight. One is to thank our outgoing chair, Jan Soland, and I've also like to say public, I really enjoyed working with you, Jan. You. And to introduce our new chair, Charlie Greer, who is sitting on my left. And uh, I think that's the extent of my power of uh, using the gavel and opening the meeting. So I'll gratefully turn that over to our new chairman, Charlie Greer. Thank you very much. Officially open our, my first school board meeting. Um, my first action this evening is actually to recognize our outgoing chairman, and I would like to do that first. So she would step down to the podium. School board members spend an inordinate amount of time, and, and it's volunteer time. But the year someone serves as school board chair, they spend even more time, believe it or not. I was thinking of. Anytime you serve on the board, you try to think of things that you would like to do that would improve the system and be remembered for something and hope that you instituted some kind of a change. So I was thinking back what Jan could remember about the past year and actually about the past couple of years and what she probably will be remembered. We have to give cre credit to Jan for having been the chair for the superintendent's search committee. And out of that, um, we, uh, that search committee brought on board Connie Goldman, who's been a great asset to our, our system. Uh, what that's brought about is a study, a reorganization, and a rebuilding of the Cape Elizabeth school system that includes our buildings, curriculum, and improved fiscal management. So Jan, when we, years down the line, remember historically Jan Solon, She's the chairman who brought on Connie Goldman. As a token of our appreciation, I would like to present to Jan Solon of the Cape Elizabeth School Board with appreciation for your deep commitment and quality of leadership as chairperson of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, year 1991 to 1992. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I, I couldn't ask to be remembered for anything better than that. That's, that's perfect. It's, I think I'm probably the first chairman in the past couple of years that could say I had a truly great year. Um, <laughs> it, it has been. Um, thank you to everybody for all your hard work. Thank you very much. I'd like to do one other thing before we officially start our meeting. We're a school system that's considered a, a good school system in the state of Maine. And I, and I was thinking about what makes a school of excellence. And I think that's really what we're striving for. We're a good system, and I think we, we're striving for excellence. And there, are, I feel, are some components which go up to which make up a uh, school of excellence. One of those is involved parents. Having active parents sends a message to students that school continues to be a priority to adults as it should be to a priority to those children. So I, it sets a priority. The second ingredient is motivated students. And I think you do that by encouraging classroom discussion and requiring independent research. Third, a challenging curriculum. 
I think outstanding schools begin with a rigorous core curriculum. And it's achieved with the aid of extensive library resources, state-of-the-art laboratory equipment, and utilization of computer technology. Fourth, a caring community. Community can become as much a part of a student's life with volunteerism, improving the student's ability to problem solve and the ability to do critical thinking. Fifth, innovative teachers. Even though they're on the front lines, teachers have sometimes little say in about how schools are run. Six, visionary leaders. No school can achieve or maintain excellence without a reform-minded administrators with strength as well as compassion. And finally, student-teacher access. And I think we're fortunate because we're essentially a medium-sized student body. And this permits a greater contact among students, teachers, and administrators. And that could be a very positive thing. I think total quality teaming of parents, teachers, staff, and students will result in a total quality education with all of us accepting responsibility for affecting, effectively allocating available resources under really tight budgetary constraints. And I see the year ahead of us as, a, as another continuing teaming approach to solving our problems. I want to thank the electorate for allowing me to continue to be a member of this very positive and ongoing and evolutionary process in our schools in this next fiscal year, I look forward as chairperson in kind of helping to guide this process. The first item on our agenda is adjustments to the agenda. And I do have an adjustment to the agenda. Under new business, item 9D, I would like to table the appointment to the Community Service Advisory Commission. Are there any adjust other adjustments to agenda? Seeing none, um, we will move on to approval of the school board minutes. The first, are there any adjustments to the regular school board meeting, May 12, 1992? Seeing none, they stand as, as passed. The next is a special school board meeting minutes of May 26, 1992. Any adjustments? Seeing none. Stand. Our next agenda item is comments by our high school representatives. If they could come forward, please. Um, last week, the high school production of My Fair Lady was a great success. It sold out two of its three nights, and it was almost packed the first night. Um, two nights of student recognition. Um, also occurred last week, the National Honor Society and Maroon Medal Society inductions, and the Evening of Excellence, which was devoted to the, um, the whole school. Evening of, Evening of Excellence was devoted to recognizing the achievements of the whole school. Uh, finally, the class of 1992 will be graduating on Friday. Ceremonies will be held at Fort Williams from 3 to 5 o'clock. The reception will follow directly after. And this year, project gra graduation is being held at the University of New England. Seniors are really looking forward to it, and we wish them the best of luck. On behalf of the SAC and the entire student body, I'd just like to thank the school board. Having been a school board representative for the past two years, I've really come to appreciate how much work goes into being a school board member and the level of genuine concern that the members really have for all of us. Um, Courtney and I have really enjoyed being able to come up here and speak and just see that people truly do care about our education. It's really been a great experience for us, and we hope that we've been able to add some insight to you by representing the students. Thank you. Just a question. Uh, do you know, do we know who's gonna be our representatives next year? Yes, um, Courtney will be a representative once again, and also Mindy Hull. Thank you very much. Rosemary. I would like to congratulate the outgoing representative for her election to president of the SAC. Thank you very much. Next, our middle school representatives. Um, Christy could not be with us tonight because of a family obligation. First of all, I'd like to say that our final dance was last week 
on Friday, and that was a great success among all the kids. The uh, sporting events will end this week, <clears throat> and the step-up day for the 7th and 8th grade will be on Monday. Um, we have one more, in one more orientation, that's for the incoming 5th graders. On uh, <coughs> Tuesday of next week, we'll have our beach day, and each grade will have an awards assembly on Wednesday, the last day of school. Parents and friends are also invited to those. The sixth grade will have it, and just for everyone's information, the sixth grade will have it at 8.45, and they're all about 45 minutes long. The eighth grade will have it at 9.30, and the seventh at 10.30. And finally, our band and chorus concerts were last week and the week before, and they were a great success as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next will be communications, and I yield to the superintendent. Thank you. Uh, we have, I have two uh, communications that deal with the award of uh, assessment project money, which comes through the USM Assessment Center, which is actually part of the partnership that we belong to. Um, the kindergarten group and the first grade group, both of whom submitted grants on uh, well, one called Kindergarten Language Arts Assessment Procedures and Portfolios, and the other one called Using Trade Books to Assess the Early Stages of Reading in First Grade. Both grants have been awarded grants of uh, $2,500, um, and uh, for a total, of course, of $5,000. And we are very proud of the teachers who uh, pulled that together. That's primarily Ted DeMille and other kindergarten teachers, and Nancy Rollis and other first grade teachers. Uh, when these grants are uh, awarded, we're always delighted. I think it's good for the teachers to get that recognition. I also recognize that we have people who uh, submitted grants that weren't funded, and I thank them for their efforts, too. It is our experience that when teachers work together to put a grant uh, on paper and submit it, whether it's funded or not, the work that's gone into planning that is very beneficial. So congratulations to the two groups that uh, were funded, and thank you to all the others who may have participated. Um, at the, I uh, also have uh, copies of a couple of other communications that have come in. One was a uh, letter from some parents on teachers, uh, that particularly it's a, uh, Ogden Williams talking about a project that this class was involved with. Um, I th have copies, and I'm not sure whether I've handed them out, but I will when we get to the mission statement of uh, letters that I've received or comments that I've received, um, sort of. Um, in some cases stating slightly different points of view, and I will go over those when we get to that point. Uh, so those are my communications. Are there any other communications on the board? Seeing none, we will now move on to the superintendent's report, the first being the Spanish test scores. And I'm going to ask Barbara Canal, who I see is already wending her way to the podium, to share that with us. I know it's good news, and thank you for coming, Barbara. Thank you. Good evening. I'm here to report on the results of the National Spanish exam this year. This exam is given annually by teachers who are members of the AATSP, the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese. It's designed to be a very challenging test because students get ranked within the state and then they're ranked within the region and then within the nation. And nationally, the winners at the four different levels are eligible for wonderful prizes like a three-week all-expenses paid trip to Spain. And not wanting to give more than one of those, um, they make the test really grueling. Perfect scores virtually never happen. Students are selected to take the exam. Generally, it's only your very best students who take it because there's a fee involved also in presenting the exam. Consequently, um, you only have your very best students in Spanish taking the test. <laughs> And even at that, nationally, the average among those better students is 40 out of the 80 possible. The test is administered under very tight controls in mid-March, and it's monitored by non-language teachers. 37% of the test is listening comprehension on a tape. Very few middle school students participate in the exam. The AATSP does not recommend that seventh graders participate because in the traditional 7th and 8th grade program, the students are covering a one-year high school course over the course of two years. And so by March of 7th grade, they really have covered very little of the book, and so it isn't viewed as worthwhile. And indeed, our students were in this position. By March, we had finished 
three chapters of a 12 chapter high school text, but our students had, most of them, three years of non-textbook based FLESS behind them. And Mrs. Dana and I, as members of AATSP, believed that our students had internalized a lot of grammar and vocabulary and that they might be able to do fairly well on the exam. And they did extraordinarily well. 26 7th and 8th grade students were selected to participate in the exam based on their academic performance. Of the 26, 24 scored above the national average of high school students taking the test. Within the state, 17 of the top 36 students were our Cape Elizabeth Middle School students. Of the top 10 places in the state, our 7th graders, none of the 8th, <laughs> garnered 2nd, two students tied for third, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Six of the top 10 places went to seventh grade students. Of the top 25 scorers in the state, 13 were ours, 12 seventh graders and one eighth grader. This year, over 470 exams were administered. This is down considerably from past years, where it's been as high as 1,100 or 1,200. Um, and a number of the schools who are usually very competitive were not participating because of budgetary constraints. But I've looked back at the, res the results of the years um, from other years and our top scores would still have been in the top 10 in the years 1987 through 90, which were the other years when I was teaching at the high school or middle school and had students participating and therefore had the results from those years. And the students really are to be commended. They did an excellent job. Subsequent to the official exam date, all of our seventh grade classes have taken the test for my research purposes. I was looking for some evaluative measure of the FLESS program. Although many of these students also scored very well, any direct comparison between how they did and the students who took it in March really isn't appropriate. This, it's skewed because they didn't take it in March at the same point in time and they didn't take it under the same conditions. Nonetheless, they did very well. I plan to analyze our students' performance on the four sections of the exam, listening comprehension, vocabulary, grammar, and reading comprehension. And I've received permission from a high school in central Maine to use the exams from their first year students, and it's a more traditional program, as a basis of comparison. My hypothesis is that our FLESS students will outperform the more traditional group on the listening comprehension and the vocabulary sections of the exam and probably not do quite as well in the reading comprehension. I'll be finishing my research over this summer and I'll have my results ready for you in the fall. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's really heartwarming and it, it, it's very consistent with the report that we heard earlier this year about the feelings that uh, teachers at the seventh grade level where they were beginning to get the uh, youngsters who'd been in the program for the full period of time. Um, Are there questions on the board? On the board? I just want to congratulate you both on the success of the program, but more specifically on the process that you're using to address the program. Uh, I think it's exemplary in, in the way that you have addressed it. Um, you have an outstanding program and still there isn't clear satisfaction. It's how can we make it better? How, why were we good? What are we going to do to make it the best program around? And then how can we teach other kids across the country in a similar style? I just think it's terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also part of the orientation meeting last night, uh, the school board goes through a list of subcommittees and other committees uh, on which uh, school board members serve. And uh, I'm going to ask our new chairman to go down those uh, lists. I think it's of, of interest to the public at large to realize, first of all, that there are a number of committees that can that boards regularly serve on. Many of these are committees that are made up of staff, sometimes uh, with additional parent representation, and it is an indication of their continuing interest uh, in, this, in the day-to-day -day working of the school as well as the input into understanding what the basis would be for future policy decisions. Well, the 1992-93 school year, the school board committee appointments are as follows. Our two major subcommittees, which are finance and policy, are first. Finance will be served by Mark Foray, Ann Chapman, and Rosemary Reed as chairman. Our policy subcommittee will be Peter Leslie, 
Jan Solon and Loretta Pond as chairperson. The Arts Committee will be Charles Greer. The Athletic Fee Committee will be Mark Foray. The Co-Curricular Committee is Rosemary Reed. The Community Team Representative is Rosemary Reed. Uh, the Legislative Liaison Contact Person will be Rosemary Reed. The Main School Board Association Delegate will be myself. Um, the PRVTC General Advisory Board will be Ann Chapman. And the Town Center Planning Committee, which is a, I believe, a sunset committee, will still remain as Rosemary Reed. The only committee that we have not um, named as yet is negotiations because presently we are still in negotiations and until those have been resolved we will not make reappointments for the next contractual year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item on my report is a discussion uh, of the Beacon School grant application and in looking at the <coughs> rules uh, it really would be appropriate for you to take a vote which you can't take at this time. I normally put votes under new business, but rather than split it, it would not be inappropriate to do it uh, after our discussion. I have given uh, a, you a draft copy uh, that I will say about the draft copy. It needs further work in the sense of getting it down to the requisite number of pages, but it is essentially what will be produced. The only thing we have left before us is to add the budget sheets, uh, which are indicated in there. There are some um, indications of how the money would be spent. Uh, for the general public, the Beacon School grant application is a, both a national and a state effort to uh, really put some significant funds into the development of science and math education. Uh, probably this is influenced by the fact that the President's national goals for the improvement of education is talking about the United States testing internationally uh, as uh, tops. <laughs> And by the end of the century. And when we look at many of the international comparisons, particularly in the field of uh, math, but it's in other fields too, uh, it's a questionable uh, process. How, in fact, is that going to be done? So this uh, is an opportunity for us to compete with other schools in Maine. There will be seven sites awarded. They will be known as Beacon Schools. The money is uh, rather significant. It, it um, amounts to about $50,000 a year. The first year would be a planning year. It's a five-year grant, and it also pays for uh, the services of a facilitator, uh, either for at the building level or, in our case, we're putting in a system-wide um, application. Um, and the facilitators would be one each in math and science. And uh, we have made some use of that locally. Uh, budget constraints have cut back on the amount of time we can use under our own funding, so it would be really helpful to have that. Um, I think right now I would just say um, I want to thank uh, Michael Efron in particular for spearheading this effort. But there was a committee that met, and Michael and Barbara Powers and Roger Rio, a parent uh, serving on the committee, and myself uh, worked uh, both together and separately to try to put the proposal together as you see it. I think Michael's uh, piece is the most important, the one that actually talks about what we would do. The rest of us were kind of working on general framework questions. Um, if you, I know it's hard to absorb a 20-page document overnight, but if you have been able to at least look at it, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Could you give us some idea of what the time frame? We are told that we have to get the grant in by the 22nd. That much we do know. Um, and the state in their general explanation of this, it's been a fairly hurried process because they did not know they were going to get the money for sure, I think until really the last six weeks, although they began to see the signs as hopeful and uh, send out indications to uh, superintendents and school people. And some of us attended a meeting about two months ago, if I remember correctly, it's in that vicinity. Uh, so we've had less than two months to work on this, and that's one of the reasons why we're bringing it in in, in a draft form at this time. Uh, I understand that they expect to be up and running for the fall session, and therefore they will be reading these um, and getting back to districts fairly quickly. However, when I went to the initial meeting, it looked to me like every school district in Maine was represented. I mean, um, we had to uh, list our intent to apply, and there were about 144 people on the list, so uh, I don't know how many of them will actually pull it all together. but. Um, how soon they can really process packages from 
let's say, even 100 schools, uh, I would think realistically that's going to take them a while. But we should know sometime this summer, yeah. one way or the other. I, I just had a comment, and that is that obviously a lot of work has gone into this. And whether or not we get this grant, which obviously would be wonderful, um, I, I think that the information that's been compiled in this and the thinking that's gone into it should help our system in the math and science area anyway. So it's a great job. Rosemary? Yes, I just did want to commend the writers. It's a, a tremendous amount of work, and it really consolidated a lot of things for me, and I appreciate it as a resource. But I would like the money, too. <laughs> Seeing Michael's presentation, it's almost like helping us with a five-year plan mm -hmm. in both mm -hmm. math and science, and I think that's the positive thing, whether we get the grant or not. Yeah. I think there is a lot of interest, among, particularly among the uh, math and science people, of course, but I've also tried to point out to staff who are not necessarily math and science people that that kind of infusion of money frees up resources for other programs on the local level so that I think we all benefit. Um, and of course, all students take math and science uh, so that that is really the, the critical piece. It's kind of an exciting vision because it is a K-12. That is one of our advantages. We are a small school district. We are on the same campus as far as our buildings are concerned. And uh, we've already gotten into the idea of coordination in math under, uh, particularly with Michael's uh, situation. Uh, but we have building coordinators and we've had, we've, we've really taken a hard look at how we pull it together. So we have um, a very strong math program, uh, science program at the high school and middle school level. The elementary teachers feel less confident that their program uh, is as strong and certainly that would be a target area for us. But whatever happens, I agree with you. We feel we've done some planning and to the degree that we can implement those plans with the budget we have, uh, we will keep right with it. Is there anyone from the public who would uh, like to address this particular subject? Seeing none, would someone tender a motion? Rosemary? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I move that we accept the uh, Beacon School grant application and uh, ask the superintendent to submit it to the state for uh, consideration. A second? Any further comment? All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Very good. We'll let you know what happens. At this point, we're at the point <coughs> in my report where I've listed end of school reports. I have two, but I suspect looking at the audience that one of them has uh, uh, brought a few people here for comments. Um, this is, I should say, in, in uh, beginning the discussion, uh, this is put on the report as an information item. It was not put under the regular consideration of new business, and the reason for that is that it is our understanding that the report on proposed revision of the, of the athletic training rules is just that, a proposal. And this is an opportunity for uh, administration, for coaches, for parents, and uh, for uh, student athletes to make comments on those proposed revisions uh, and for the board in turn to give some clarification as to how it regards that proposal. Uh, so having said as much, um, I would ask Mr. Miles to start the discussion with a brief summary of a report that most of us I think have had a chance to read. Thank you very much. Um, after an incident last fall involving the athletic training rules, the administration formed a review committee composed of students, parents, coaches, and administrators to consider various issues surrounding those rules. The athletic contract review committee met several times during the winter and early spring to review the current rules which students must sign before they are permitted to participate in a sport. The key provision in question here and those rules involves the consequences for using tobacco, alcohol, or drugs. I might note that our current policy um, will remain in effect until the school community can agree on a replacement. Some of the issues surrounding this policy are as follows. Despite the school's concern over the use of tobacco, alcohol, and narcotics in, in student use off of school grounds and outside of school activities beyond the school 
the question really is are those activities beyond the school's limits of responsibility or are they something the school is responsible for the question that the committee tried to grapple with is how can the school enforce any kind of rule when the violations occur off school grounds and if you will outside of the school's purview does the school in this situation set itself up by having such a uh, such rules that are difficult if not impossible for us to monitor and enforce and on which we really must rely on others to monitor um, the difficulties of enforcement of the contract aside does the contract in its current form contract which involves if a student violates a suspension from four contests and, and a consultation with a substance abuse counselor, does that contract do what it was intended to do? That is, does it deter drinking and drug use by student athletes? We know from some students and parents that it does. But we know from an even greater number of students confirmed by questionnaire and parent comments and student comments that many students ignore the contract. If students do not see themselves as bound by the current rules and student substance use is not effectively reduced, is the school's fundamental interest here really being served? Thus the basic task for the review committee was to develop a policy alternative for athletics and for that matter for all co-curricular activities which would control substance abuse more than the current policy does. We as adults may feel more comfortable with a tough, clear rule forced on the students but if such a rule is difficult to monitor and enforce, are we actually serving the interest of reducing the substance use? It is in this light that the recommendation of the Contract Review Committee focuses on getting commitment from students to abide by the training rules established by the coach and the team. Some of the adults on the committee, in fact, I suspect most of the adults on the committee, um, are concerned that there will be some inconsistency from team to team and that some of the contracts may not be as strong as we would like them to be. These concerns have been eloquently stated in a letter to the board by one of our coaches. I think the concerns are very important, but they may not address one of the major failings of our current policy. The issue here is not just standards and the consistency, but one of voluntary compliance of the students. If the proposed revisions cut down on substance use, I think the contracts or the team contracts um, are worthy of our support. The committee proposes, therefore, that we pilot uh, such team contracts in the 1992-93 school year. Now, there are a number of people who are here who I think would like to, to share their views with you. I don't know how you would like to work this. Uh, it includes <coughs> the athletic directors, and coaches, parents, students. Could the public give me an indication of who would like to talk on this particular subject? Okay, there appear to be about seven or eight of you. Um, I will allow you about two minutes per person. Okay, I'd like to briefly read a letter from one parent who couldn't be here, if okay. I might. Uh, it is from Dr. George Higgins. Dear Frank, I write to applaud your efforts in developing what I believe to be a significantly improved student contract. I am most favorably impressed by the recent draft I reviewed. It was a pleasure and honor, along with motivated students, faculty, and other parents, to participate in the workshops which led to this document. The dialogue which took place during those workshops was lively, insightful, and constructive. I believe you have nicely summed up the spirit of those discussions. Most importantly, you have empowered the students to assume an appropriate amount of control in this most important and personal contract. In summary, I fully support the content of the student contract and believe that incorporations of the recommendations offered therein will lower the incidence of substance abuse among our students. Thank you for your able and much appreciated efforts. Sincerely, George L. Higgins, MD. Mr. Weatherby, do you want to speak first? I think one of the important things that we have to consider here is the part of dealing with the present policy. Is it deterring or cutting down on the student's use of uh, substances? Since the, the fall sports season, and we had the incident during soccer, we have not had uh, one single person violate our contract from the point of view of abusing substance. We've caught four kids smoking in school and that's been it. Now I find it hard to believe that during that time that not one single student athlete has violated that, uh, that contract. 
Uh, we could ask some students if they think that everybody has uh, strictly abided by the rules, and I think they'd be very honest in telling you no, that they haven't. And I think that we have to look to something where the students become actively involved in what takes place here. We set these rules and we expect them to abide by them. The students and the parents sign these forms just so they can play, period. Because they know that if they don't sign the forms, they can't play. And I think that we have to do something here, some way to get handle on this, to help these kids through what I see as a very difficult time. And I think having the students involved in this is very important. I remember the last school board meeting, the fiasco that we went through here, and I see that we followed exactly what I gather the school board wanted. We've had students, parents, coaches, administrators, two school board members involved in this committee that's worked on this uh, during the school year. And I think we have come up with what I see as, a, as something that we really ought to try. Uh, where we've had the most success in athletics with our uh, athletic contract is in cases where the students themselves have decided that we're going to follow this, this is what we're going to do. And that's where we've had the most success. And I think in instances where, where the coaches actually make the students part of the decisions that are involved, that we have the most success there. I think back, particularly the swimming season, and uh, some of the workouts that our swimmers did were absolutely incredible. I remember about two weeks before they were going to do it, Coach Pullis told me that the kids were going to swim 15,000 yards. Now that's about nine miles in one day. And I said, gee, I said, Bill, that's an awful long ways. He said, I know it's said, but I think in order for us to be successful, we need to do that. He said, but I have to get the kids to realize it's important for them to do this also. And if the kids don't believe in this, he said, then I'm not going to do it. And he talked and prepared the kids for this. And a week before they had the workout, the kids were all in favor. They felt that they should do this, and they wanted to do it, and they did. And I think we all realized what a successful season they had uh, from their hard work. And I think that's just an example of where if we can let students be involved in the decisions that we make, we might make some real headway in this particular problem. Thank you. Anyone else? Please come forward and just state your name, please. I'm David Townsend, and I'm playing on the lacrosse team and the basketball team. Um, I think it's mostly a question of ownership. Uh, you know, whose contract is it going to be? Is it going to be the students or is it going to be the administrations where the students and the parents have to sign it just in order to play and for no other reason? I saw they, when they give you the contract, the, the, the present contract, they give it to you on a, just a photocopy sheet. There's all the rules. It's, there's nothing personal about it. That, that you, you have no ownership of it. And I think with this, with this new proposed contract, the students are actually going to uh, put in the time and effort into making a contract making it something that'll work for them, making something that'll work for the team. Um, and in taking ownership of it, I think that it'll be something that they're going to be able to follow because they're going to they're feel the indebtedness of their team and to their friends that are on the team. And I think that's the big question involved. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm Tracy Weatherby, and I'm um, head girls cross country coach, and I assist in uh, coaching spring and sometimes winter track. And I would just like to say that I am in full support of this newly proposed policy. I feel that um, although there, are, there probably will be inconsistencies between the teams in exactly what the policy states and what the students need, I think that um, that is a consequence of the type of individuals each sport attracts. I think that um, there's a difference in each type of sport, and that's why. Um, individuals choose those sports because of those differences so I think inherently you will find differences in the attitudes coming from um, each individual team however I think underlying um, all of this it will be a consistent policy I think most of the coaches um, obviously do not approve of their athletes using alcohol or drugs during their season because it inhibits them um, from performing better and therefore it, it kind of gyps the whole team in that respect if one person uses um, drugs or alcohol so I think that that will be an underlying um, policy throughout each team's individual policies. But as according to um, other uh, adults' concerns about um, the inconsistencies between teams, I think that that is part of this process that we're trying to establish. Um, that each team can, like David had said, own its own policy and 
come up with it with their coach and therefore the coach can have um, influence about what kind of things their athletes need to be doing. So I, I really um, believe in this new policy. I think that the students are mature enough to work with their coach and their parents to establish what they need. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Chris Richards. I'm a varsity assistant lacrosse coach. I've been here for eight years. And um, I do a lot of hanging out at the school because of my job and frequency and working at nights and stuff. I come two, three hours early and I sit and I talk with my kids or just about any athlete or any student in the school. And it's been obvious to me for the past four or five years that the contract is a joke to a lot of these kids. And that started to, wor to worry me. It's worried me for several years. And the reason I like this present proposal is in the old system, it's them against us. I don't want it to be them against us. I want to work with these kids. I want them to have a voice in what's going on. I'll help them through it. We're not going to just sit back as coaches and say, you guys decide what the policy is. I mean, it's our teams. If I can speak for lacrosse. Coach Birch and I are going to get in there tooth and nail with these kids and work something out that we can live with that we think will help the kids, help the team, help the sport, help the school. But I think these kids, in these meetings I attended, they're ready for it. They're tired of losing championships because three or four kids go out and get loaded and they can't say anything to them because, well, they've been doing it off and on during the season. Because they haven't agreed on anything as a team. I have kids on my team that have had to look after other players and we've said, hey, could you look after him and whatever. We don't know if he's doing it, but they are, they're in a tough position because there have been times where they've partied. Now, how, they can't turn around and say, well, hey, you know, uh, you know, you can't do this anymore. But if we agree on something, if we sit down as a team and we get together and the kids sit down and agree on something, I think they're going to follow it a lot better because it's just that whole they and us mentality has driven a wedge between really helping these kids because there are kids, irregardless of the fact that they're just athletes, that have substance abuse problems. They have problems with alcohol. And as a coach, I'd like to help them out. And I think under the current contract system, I just don't see, I don't see anybody stepping forward. I don't see any feedback from the kids. It's a very difficult situation. Um, I'm not saying this, this proposal is the end all, but I think we need a change. There's no doubt in my mind we need a change. I love these kids too much. I've been here eight years in Cape Elizabeth. I want something to change. I don't want somebody else to get wrapped around a tree. I want something to happen right now because these kids deserve everything we can give them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else in the public like to address this issue? <clears throat> My name is John Brady. I'm a parent and a member of the committee. Um, I'd just like to mention that uh, procedures like this are not without precedence. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, several years ago, I had occasion to, to put in a program like this when I was a, a teacher and coach. And uh, I don't want to tell you how long ago that was, but uh, it really works well. When you give the kids the responsibility, let them take it themselves. I think you'd really be surprised. Uh, also working on the committee with the youngsters, when you see the rational thinking that they put into this proposal, I think it just gives you tremendous faith in, in their reasoning skills. And I just encourage you to uh, give it your approval. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anyone else from the public? <coughs> My name's Tom Wentworth. I'm a parent. I uh, have two children in the Cape Elizabeth uh, school system, and I was also a member of every meeting that the committee had. Uh, in the beginning, I had a feeling that it was kind of sad that uh, you even have to have a contract. I, I was an athlete, uh, quite successful, came from a family that uh, athletics was pretty much our life. Uh, but this is in 1960, it's 1990. And contracts are, are something that we really uh, uh, live with these days. And uh, as everybody has already stated, um, I'm a firm believer after the, the meetings that we have had that uh, the type of contract that we have now really doesn't affect the athlete that is the high performance athlete, the athlete that you really don't need to worry about, uh, they're always going to be in training and performing. The athlete I think that we're pretty much targeting here 
is the the athlete that uh, might uh, stray and wander and, and uh, be involved in some things that they they probably should not uh, not probably they should not be involved with uh, drinking drugs and so forth. Um, it's exciting. It really is. It's something that I think um, I I think it's 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 a great opportunity. It's, very, it's to me it's very progressive uh, to allow students to to set the standards and to set the outcome for, for what's actually going to happen. Um, I, all I can say uh, is that if it doesn't uh, improve and it doesn't work, we can always go back to the, to the type of contract that we have now. I think that's the way we really have to look at this. And um, I, I really uh, <coughs> hope that, that you give it your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bryce Roberts. I have three, uh, two, two now that are playing sports here all year round. Um, <clears throat> everything, I guess, that I was going to say has been said, but uh, I think what we, ha what we did have certainly didn't work. And I think that what we have come up with, and there were some compromises, uh, but we came up with something we all could live with, was that uh, I think that even if it doesn't work, it's better than what we had, and we can be modified or all this goes along. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Any, anyone on the board would like to address this issue? Rosemary? Um, yes, I just had a question for Mr. Weatherby. Um, Mr. Weatherby, are there rules against meeting um, of the coach and the players throughout the summer that to get this um, uh, communicated, the new uh, rules communicated to the athletes, we might uh, somehow violate MSSPA rules or are we safe? to say there'll be no violation. The summer is open season. Everybody competes all the game. Thank you. Anyone else? Rose, uh, Loretta? I, I was wondering, do the parents have any role in this? It, it, would it, be, it would just be the students and the coach and the You say would the parents would have they? any role in, in the contract? Yes. Um, are they supposed to tell if their child drinks and um, is? I think that that depends on on the uh, on the team contract I think what what the committee focused on was less the role of the parents and more the commitment from the students uh, feeling that if if there isn't some um, compliance and voluntary compliance by the students then we we will not make progress uh, we may not be any worse off, but we will not make progress. And I think it's, it's in that light. But I, um, I don't think we really discussed extensively what the role of parents ought to be. And that's a good point. It's a good point. Um, I, I, I think that, that um, we could, we perhaps ought to add, we, we have a, a list in, in the proposed uh, new way of, of dealing with contracts. We have a list of, of minimum uh, concerns that we felt each each contract that that the groups will will draw up um, and we might add really a role for parents in that and, and have them address that very specifically um, but that's not formally addressed by the policy and I, I have a few um, questions I, I received a number of calls on on this and I talked to a number of people about it and and thinking about those calls and what people are saying here tonight. I guess I'm unclear as to what it is exactly that we're trying to address through this whole contract issue. Are we attempting to solve a social problem? Um, is this intended to be a training device? I'm, I'm really not clear on what exactly we're trying to get at. I hear, hear things all over the place and I think we need to be clear on exactly what we're trying to get at here. Did the committee talk about that? Yeah, yes, the committee did. Um, and I think the answer is yes to both issues. We are trying to deal with a social problem. Um, and we are trying to deal with training rules for athletic teams, which is how this uh, arose. Mixed into that also is a concern about co-curricular activities in general and the whole issue of substance use by students, um, which turns out to be a, still a, a very a little different problem than just athletic teams. But the answer is yes. We're trying to cut down on what we see as um, 
student, student drinking. Um, there's, there's no question about that. I think that's a concern for many of the adults that we see that. And, and one of the problems is maybe we, I, I think we as um, people working in a school feel we need to take a stand on that. And I think the school board's taken a very clear stand on substance abuse and substance issues. I think there's some limits to what we can do. And that's a problem. And that's something that, that the committee started with, is, is whether or not really the school has any role outside of school activities and outside of school time in policing this issue. I think coaches feel that there is a role. I think they feel it affects, I think they number one are concerned about kids, as you heard Coach Richards talk. I think they feel it affects the performance of their athletes. Um, I think they feel it, it affects the commitment of the students to what they're doing and their focus on the task. I have a few other ones. Continue. Can I just? Continue. Um, since there wouldn't be one set of rules for, for all the teams, what would happen in a case where it's, it's one thing, I know, for everybody to talk about a hypothetical situation that has not come up yet. What happens when you have a kid who runs afoul of the rules of a particular team um, what's, the, what's the course of action if they don't like the particular punishment once it's meted out against them or the parents don't like it? Is there a procedure in place that the administration would follow for investigating? And I, I think I th it's, a, it's a good question because it involves, I think, a succession of, of activities that could take place. Um, our thought is that it would operate very similarly to the, to the current contract, that, that is, uh, if, for example, uh, a team decided that students who, in, in, uh, who violate a rule, training rule, would miss one game, two games, or whatever, um, and a student was reported to the team or to the administration to have violated that, the administration would enforce that team's contract along with the coach, and the student would be <coughs> suspended, let's say, for example, for, for two games or one game. If, if the student wanted to appeal, um, our assumption is they would appeal in the same way that they currently do, and that is to appeal to the superintendent and ultimately the school board, which is why I think it's very important that this process uh, be sufficiently clear from your perspective and supportable from your perspective that you would be comfortable with that. I think that's most well, important. Under those why circumstances, we would have to review. I mean, if it's ultimately our responsibility, then I would think we would need to see every single set of rules that every team had if we're ultimately the ones responsible. Is that correct? I mean, from a legal standpoint? Uh, well, not necessarily from a legal standpoint, because if you're operating under or in the appeal mode, um, as long as you're fully informed before you have the hearing, you don't necessarily have to judge the merit of the original rule. You would be judging the merit of whether somebody uh, because he or she is not guilty or I'm not sure what exactly would be the, the issue. Um, this is one of those very gray areas. We have right now a board policy and the board policy is talking about um, use or abuse uh, on, uh, for employees as well as students as far as school grounds and school activities uh, is concerned. Uh, this whole contract issue uh, gets into an area that exceeds your policy in the sense that um, penalties are possible for behavior off school ground and at a time when the student is not involved in a school function. Therefore, it is a kind of pledge, if you will, um, that has historically, I think, been grounded in the idea that uh, participation in sports uh, is a privilege, it is not a right and that uh, society, certainly generally speaking, would hope that that would be an incentive to students to um, help them monitor their behavior. Uh, so as far as the way our, our uh, sports regulations have been handled in the past, they are labeled administrative regulations. Now we do ask the board to review administrative regulations, you know, in our review of the policy book. On the other hand, there are times when there uh, is certainly considerable latitude built into those administrative regulations with the understanding that the administrators involved will use some discretion. I guess what the practical issue here 
is how much discretion do you want to back up in those rules if, when as and if they're being um, changed. And right now, this is June, although school doesn't start until September, athletic practices start before then. And again, from a practical consideration, what is manageable uh, in a change process between now and September. And I think uh, where, how comfortable are you with this uh, change? Uh, what would you have to know before you would feel comfortable? What process would you like the uh, high school administration, coaches, et cetera, to use in bringing back more specific regulations? I think we've already had some questions that do not seem to have written answers anyway. They may be Agreed. answers, but not written ones. Um, and it would seem to me important to, um, to set out some expectation for what, would, um, what you could live with. Anyone else? Mark? I really do like the concept of uh, being certain that students buy into the contract. It's very clear that a contract signed under duress is not a legal binding contract. And I think many student athletes would feel somewhat coerced into signing the paper that they've currently been signing. Uh, the other side of that is that every type of substance abuse rehabilitation group functions around a peer group dynamic. And so I think using that concept and applying it to teams or other co-curricular activities is a good idea. The concern that I have about this is that the new substance abuse policy enacted by the board was also relatively vague in terms of what the recourse is to be for infractions that have occurred. And there is certainly merit for that wording and reasons for uh, writing the policy in that manner. But I think it, if we are to move in this direction, I think it's critical that we have a monitoring device that will follow not only the athletic contract concept, but also how that ties in with the entire overall school substance abuse contract or substance abuse policy. There's apparently been a change in reporting since the fall, and that's important information. But I think we also, if we do embark on a new way of addressing this problem, it's critical that we have a very clearly defined assessment tool and are able to revisit it and determine what revisions are needed or whether a new system is needed. And I think it's critical that those be in place prior to accepting any type of new approach to uh, policing the problem of substance abuse. Jan? I'm not real sure which side of the coin I come down on with this issue, possibly because I don't deal with kids this age except that I have to wonder why it is a piece of paper and why it is um, either getting to talk about it or not getting to talk about it makes the difference as to whether or not an athlete will drink or use drugs. It seems to me that it's, it's a very moral question and I would think that hopefully kids would have values that would say with or without a piece of paper I don't want to do this because it's not the right thing to do and it's going to hurt my team. But since that doesn't seem to be the case, um, one question that I have is, or I guess a statement that I have is, if this is what would do it, fine. But I have to really question whether the last contract was truly um, enforced the way it should have been in the first place. I, I wonder if perhaps the first time something happened, there was an incident, if, if the consequences had been, from the coaches to the administration, had been dealt swiftly and, um, and to the ultimate degree, if that example would not have been enough to uh, curtail more incidents instead of saying, well, some of the coaches enforce it and some don't and leave it at that and say, well, for this team and this uh, part of the season, we'll do it this way and so forth. I, I still question whether uh, the old way was adequately tried. But, but if people feel that it was and that this would do it, um, fine. Anyone else? Rosemary? 
Um, I, w I would just like to say if the superintendent was asking uh, what would make me or we as board members uh, more comfortable with this, I would say that from my perspective, I would like uh, it very uh, completely and, and loudly and often explained what the expectations are, both the role of the parent, the role of the student, the role of the team, and not that everyone has to sign a contract in order to play, but I certainly hope that members of the team will all sign that they agree that the conditions set above the signatures uh, were all acceptable and fully understood by the members. Uh, the other concern that I have is that parents and students know what help is available to them when they use substances that we have in our current policy. I have yet to see anyone who really knew what was in the policy that we passed uh, in September. And I think if they knew what that policy uh, statement said, that it might be helpful in having them understand um, that we're not uh, trying to punish uh, actions. We are trying to encourage appropriate and healthy uh, behavior in our athletes and students in general. This is a complicated subject uh, for all of us. Uh, one of the things that troubles me the most about this discussion is uh, the way we passed over rapidly the, uh, the issue of uh, so many people being willing to sign contracts that they have no intention of keeping. And I wonder if that's a, a value that we ought to address just as uh, clearly as the value uh, in good training practices and avoiding drugs and alcohol and tobacco if you're on an athletic team. I never having said that, uh, I guess I would say that this study committee meets uh, all of my requirements for looking at a complicated issue. It involves the students, involves the coaches, and it involved a lot of parents. Uh, and I'm willing to defer to their, uh, to their judgment, but I would ask that the same group, or essentially the same group, report back to us in one year in detail as to how they think this has worked. Go ahead. Um, we heard from a couple of coaches tonight. We also got, a, a, as you said, a very eloquent letter from another coach expressing another opinion. Have all the coaches weighed in on this as to whether they want this responsibility or think it's appropriate for them to have this responsibility? Um, there, were, there were a number, I think you have a, you have a list of, of some of the coaches that were involved in participating in, in drawing it up. Mr. Weatherby, <coughs> I think you, you have some more information on that than... Uh, there was been only one coach who had been not in favor. I think we have a letter from that coach. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I think, um, I think coaches feel that um, this may make things better, but I, I think it would also be candid to say that coaches have some reservations. And one of the things that coaches did talk about in, in our discussions was the need to have consistency within a program. So we're talking about a basketball, boys basketball contract, if you will so that the freshman, the JV, and the varsity boys teams all are operating in the same, in the same situation. Um, and a, and a, I think there would be one for the girls program, so that I think within that kind of a, of a cluster, they want some consistency because they feel that they simply can't uh, uh, have a program, if you will, a sport program that has inconsistency. But I think that, you know, it really is something we would like to try because we think it will make it better. And I think we, we very much like uh, Mr. Leslie's notion that we report back in some detail because we are also um, doing this, I think, on an assumption and a hope um, that because of the involvement, it, it, it will improve things. And certainly if it does improve things, there's, there's no point in, in doing that this way. But I think it's, we think we've got to try something. Having served on that committee, I still have a couple concerns and seeing the recommended athletic policy, uh, administrative policy come out, it's actually not a policy, but an administrative guideline. 
I, I see that there really isn't a clear administrative process of what happens to those contracts when they come back. It just says it comes back to the athletic director. Will those be reviewed? And, and if they really, if there is an inconsistency from sport to sport that's really obvious, I mean, will that be addressed? Or are we just going to let those contracts stand? Where, where is the administrative function in this? Well, we, we talked in our discussion about whether there should be some minimum standards for each contract. And one of the concerns of, of the, the coaches and the students is that if you set minimums, you're really dictating, if you will, another set of standards. And I think the response was that there probably will be some inconsistencies. Now, to what degree, I, with no experience in, in this matter, it would be hard for me to, to uh, hazard a, a guess. But I think that, it, that we feel that even with some inconsistencies, if there is the commitment of the students to do this and to, in a sense, abide by the rules. Um, Mr. Leslie talked about a, um, a sense of integrity that he felt was, at least I'm interpreting your remark, he felt was missing if somebody would sign something and then not honor it. And I think that, that the, the, the feeling on the part of the students was they had no part in this. They, they really, it was, you do this or you don't play. You, we can argue about this at some point, and I can see the argument rising. But I think they feel there would be more integrity from their point of view in this commitment. And I think we would simply go with that inconsistently unless it were bizarre in some way, and I, I wouldn't know what that would be. I think if we tried to iron out all those inconsistencies, then we end up writing the rules again. It, it, there's a tension here. I, I see that. I would just hope that these would be reviewed and kind we of We absolutely term. would review them, and I think we should do more than review them. We should review them, and we should publish them. In a sense, they should be public documents. Okay. My other concern is the amount of additional stress and time commitment upon the coaches to, to implement this process. You know, is this going to, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm, I have a concern about, that, that what is the planning to implement this? Well, our, our thought at the moment is that, that this contract would probably be drawn up in, in one or two team meetings at the very beginning of the preseason and written up and signed, submitted to the athletic director, um, published then by us so that it's a public document sent to parents, um, and that this, its administration, if you will, would not take any more time on the coach's part than the current contract does of monitoring the student athletes and being in touch with their students and, and uh, so on and so forth. I think that's where I would see that at the moment. Jan. To go along with the time issue, it seems to me like we spend large chunks of school time starting in grade school talking to kids about drugs and alcohol. And I guess, I, to me, the inconsistency is that we can take that much time away from academic time and still have to have this kind of discussion now. And I, I wonder why those programs perhaps aren't more effective. Mr. DeFusco. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Um, I just want to address one question that Mrs. Solon raised that may clear up concerning, as you mentioned, the enforcement of, of the policy. In my seven years as assistant principal, we've had approximately 40 cases in which violations have occurred that have been brought to the administration. In every single case, there have been consequences. There's never been a case in which a violation occurred and there were no consequences. Where the inconsistency occurred was sometimes varying that consequence. Right. So I think it's important for you to know that there was never a situation, to my knowledge, in which a violation occurred and then no, no uh, consequences occurred. But we tried to take in consideration length of season and things of that nature and the infraction itself. So I just wanted to clear that up for the board also. Rosemary. Uh, Mr. DeFusco, if I may, do you remember offhand out of those 40 um, situations, how many were female athletes? I believe uh, three or four. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple um, comments, and, and one is that I think it's great. You know, I'm a great proponent of having kids, parents, everybody involved here. But you know, the bottom line with this is that we are talking about students doing something that is, you know, illegal anyway. So you know, I don't, I don't think we have to 
you know, continually make it comfortable for people. It, it, you know, we are talking about they're doing something that's illegal. Um, the other thing is, is there, there is no minimum consequence that, that you're looking for. I hate to keep harping on this, but what if somebody comes back and there's just really, they just say, please don't do this. Is that going to be acceptable? Um, that there isn't a consequence missing a certain number of games or something like that? Um, it would not be acceptable to me, no. But, um, and, and I think I, w and I wouldn't, I think we, well, I, I won't speak for Mr. Weatherby. It would not be acceptable if there would be no consequence. Um, I, I don't know what the range of consequences w would be. And I would certainly want to address that with a coach and with the team and say, look, this is not an acceptable situation, um, that, there's, that there's nothing. Um, I, I really believe that students w would not want nothing either. I, I think there's, I, I really think we need to give them more credit than, uh, I think we need to give them a lot of credit. I think they will be um, very adult and responsible about this. I may be wrong, but that's been my experience in working with students. So if you give them responsibility, they accept it, and they are frequently harder on themselves than we are. We have a bit of a dilemma here because these are the same students who signed the contract fully intending to ignore it. Um, so, excuse me if I'm no, just I, a little I, bit cynical. I understand your degree of skepticism. But um, just, just a couple other points, and, and that is while, while we're going through this process, could we look around at other models and what other schools have done? Obviously, this is a national, probably an international dilemma. Could we look at some other models of what other schools, how other schools are handling this. And also, I would feel a lot more comfortable if there was an administrative procedure uh, for dealing with the situation and, and from the moment will, it comes we up. We will get that, we may have that forthcoming. These contracts actually are training rules, correct? It, it, that's what we put them under, yes. But we've really given them much more strength than that, I think, in terms of the substance abuse provision. Um, what we have done is made the current, the current contract, which is, is, will be in, uh, in effect until we replace it with this or, or something that we all feel comfortable with. The, the athletic part of that parallels the school's substance abuse rules. Um, so that there's, there's a, a, an intent here to be congruent. Um, I guess my question is, this new format would actually be a set of training rules which encompassed the the abuse or use of, of substance abuse. That's that's really where it's been placed in, in terms of athletics is in the training rules. Yes. Okay. So that's what those coaches would be bringing back to you. As that's a right. Set of training. Well, there rules. Is, there is a set of training rules already in the student handbook, and 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 the substance abuse portion of that is an, an addenda to those training rules. And what Mr. Weatherby has done at the beginning of each season um, is to get parents together. Um, they must come to the meeting, and they, he reviews these rules, he reviews the substance abuse provisions of them, um, so that when they sign it, they know what they are signing and how, how he and we feel about it. But there are coaches who have even more stringent training rules than the ones, or variations. Each coach has variations. Um, for example, the hockey coach this winter um, would set curfews for his, his team and he would call their homes, and when he found them missing, as some of the students would attest, they did not play. They knew they would not play, and they did not play. So there are additions to those training rules, yes. So to me, this is what would be coming back. Is there a set of training rules right. em embodying this concept of exactly. substance abuse? And in addition to the training rules, it would be the consequences for breaking the rule. Right. Correct. Now, is, is a, a letter going to go home to the parents explaining what the rules are by each coach? Yes, we will, we will send the, con the team's contract home to parents. Are they going to sign it and send it back? I think what we will ask parents to do is sign that they have seen the contract. I, I think the whole issue of a... Of a <coughs> Dr. Foray said it, a legally binding contract is something that's a little different here. I, I, I'm not sure that um, legal counsel would say this is a legally binding contract. I think what we're saying is to somebody, you admit that you have seen read the rules and know what they are. Um, I think it's in that spirit. Now, in, in the past one, we have asked parents to turn in students 
Um, that has happened very infrequently. And in the past, if parents had not signed that particular document, then the child in play, what's the, they're not the same consequences now. Well, um, I think we could put the provision in it if you will not sign this, but, but it, I think we're going to ask a different question. We could certainly put in the provision that you have seen these rules, you know what they are, and that's what gives your child permission to play the sport. Anyone else? Rosemary. Uh, just one more. Um, Frank, when this um, mailing goes home to people, I have um, a couple of suggestions for the wording. Sure. And one is the elimination of the word activity, uh, since this right. is limited to sports yeah. and there are a few other things. We're going to pick up the co-curricular activity piece of it in the fall. It, it, we thought this might address both, but it, it, there were some significant differences between a sport and a yearbook, for example, that make it... Right. Well, there were two references to co-curricular yes, and activity. Yes, I will delete those, yes. Um, also, if the language could be consistent with the in-place, for example, the use of the um, phrase, uh, use of um, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, and just, you know, so that the language is consistent so people might be able to refer to either document. That's the end of my comment. So I sense there is a uh, consensus here for this to proceed on. If anyone had any really objections, please voice them. I think I already did. Okay. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a consensus to, to try this with some suggestions. We will, uh, we will, we will get back to you um, shortly, um, a process, and get some feedback from you on that. Okay. And involve the parents yes. as much as possible. Yes, we will. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, difficult topic. Yeah. Moving on, uh, the summer maintenance and classroom moves I did include in your packet a short memo that went out to all staff members and uh, it explains what part of what uh, Sue Weatherby's ongoing role is in uh, trying to use a coordinated approach to not only <coughs> keeping track of various activities under maintenance and custodial work, but also uh, the summer uh, classroom moves. Uh, there's been a really, I think, um, obvious effort to reach out to classroom teachers. They've been given forms to check what they need done, what they don't need done. Uh, we are moving, including cla uh, classrooms at the middle school, somewhere upwards of 40 over 40 classrooms, some of them are not going very far in the sense that grouping, regrouping the larger classes at the middle school is um, uh, definitely taking up, you know, it's not moving from one building to the other, but it definitely is a move. So I just want to let you know that that's very much going on. We have met with fourth grade teachers and with kindergarten teachers. They're getting, of course, special attention because of the nature of what's happening in their cases. Um, I certainly thank and compliment Sue with the way she's working uh, with Charlie Freeman and uh, Gary Spencer in order to coordinate things. Uh, I'm feeling that we got it under control, but there is a lot of work that has to be done this summer. I, if you have any questions, I would. Anybody want to help? <laughs> <laughs> and the last item under my report is the uh, Handicap Access Committee. Um, the committee itself, it's an, advi an advisory committee. Uh, Shirley Willis has been uh, chairing that and uh, has agreed to continue doing that. And uh, uh, furthermore, we have some parent representation. Uh, and I want to point out that Michael McGovern has been sitting on that committee uh, because this is not just a school issue. It is a municipal town and school building issue. Uh, the members of the committee are Nick Burnett, Kathleen Egan, Michael McGovern, Rebecca Smith, Heather Tangway, Mandy Garmy, Rick DeFusco, myself, Dwight Smith, Gary Spencer, and Sue Weatherby. Uh, and we have, from time to time, had other parents attending. We have, um, uh, we have, ten the, the committee has scheduled a hearing for the week of the 22nd. Uh, Sue, can you help me with the, is it the 22nd or the 23rd? Excuse me, pardon me? It did turn out to be the 22nd. Monday the 22nd at uh, 7.30. We'll 7 to 9. 7 to 9. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Um, that will be advertised in the Courier. It also will be on the bulletin board outside. Um, we are really interested in letting the public in general know this is not just a school building issue, even though the majority of the municipal buildings uh, in the town of Cape Elizabeth are schools. Uh, we want to point out that this is an issue uh, and the law is now expanded definitely refers to all public buildings. In addition, there is the issue of handicap access to playing fields, to spectator uh, areas, um, and the people that we've had working on our, our uh, study to give us some guidance as to what actually has to be done to comply with um, codes are giving us some sense of what, what that means. So the point of having a public meeting uh, which is also, by the way, a part of the way the legislation is laid out, is to try to attract people, whether they themselves have had to deal with a handicapping condition, as a member of their family, know somebody. Um, we are looking for people to uh, join together who are interested in this, and we invite you to our meeting on the 22nd at 7 to 9 at the community center building next door, the 1226, which I'm going to insist on calling you. 1066 for the rest of my life. Um, any questions on that? You'll be hearing a lot more about it. It is an issue that we'll, uh, we've already looked at in our school space study committee. We've had some recommendations. There will be some, obviously, some implications for renovation of our buildings, but there are other things that we have to do before or concurrently with getting into renovation projects, some of them outside or um, as they say, access to grounds as well as access to buildings. Okay. And one, excuse me, one other thing I, I just wanted to ask Paul. Paul, were you, did you come down to talk about the Beacon School Grant? No, okay. I, we had it. Hmm. That's fine. I just was, was <laughs> let, I had seen you come in and I wasn't sure we'd already talked about that. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to school board subcommittees and reports. The first will be the finance sub subcommittee report, and this will be Peter Leslie's last as subcomm subcommittee chairman. Well, uh, first of all, I want to uh, you know, thank the chairman for allowing me to wiggle off the, uh, the finance uh, committee this year. Uh, I've been on the school board for four years. As I look back over the last three, I think I've spent an uh, inordinate amount of time uh, on uh, finances and on negotiations and uh, frankly it's not something that I thought would happen to me uh, when I joined the school board. I somehow had uh, visions of uh, working on uh, things that were dear to my heart such as uh, the one we heard about tonight, the, uh, the introduction of foreign languages in the elementary school. Uh, but it didn't turn out that way and uh, while I guess I'm condemned to continue a while longer on negotiations, which is related to finance. I'm very glad that this is my last uh, report, uh, and uh, uh, there is actually no report tonight. Uh, <laughs> I, could, I could mention, uh, if we were, uh, you know, desperate for substance, that uh, we, uh, we did uh, submit to the, uh, uh, the teacher's uh, bargaining unit uh, this afternoon. Uh, the school board's offer. Uh, this is uh, later than we've done it uh, in most years because of a number of reasons, partly the complexity, but partly the, uh, the fact that we didn't find out until quite recently what the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, cost of health care insurance would be. So that is uh, underway, and uh, we'll see how that uh, turns out. Uh, and that, I think, is my report, unless there are any uh, either observations from the other members of uh, the committee or comments from the board. I thank you, Peter, and I hope you will continue on the negotiations as a, we'll as a policy subcommittee member. <laughs> okay, our next is policy subcommittee report. This again will be Anne's last report as a policy subcommittee chairman. I'm not going to make a speech. I'm just going to give a short report. <laughs> um, we, we last met on May 19th, and we're continuing to slog through the instruction section. I don't know how else to put it, but we still have a long way to go. But we do have some um, policies uh, for first and second reading tonight. And I had a question for Connie that I, I should have asked before. Do we have to vote on a policy we're deleting, or do we just have to note it? We are deleting a, we are 
suggesting a deletion. Um, I'm not sure that, yes, I guess it would be, you know, crossing the I's and dotting the T's. Yes. Did you want to say something? Oh, I, I just, the, the policy subcommittee is not empowered to make those decisions, right. so we would obviously have to vote on it. <laughs> Okay, there is a current policy to be deleted, recommended by the policy subcommittee. It is IGDJA. I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. And any discussion? Why don't you read what it is? Okay. Um, the IGDJA is announcing summer athletic schedules and length of seasons not necessary to have board, board policy. All those in favor? 7-0. I just want to say one more thing. That is, it's been really fun to do this and I'm going to continue to come kind of haunt the meetings and I'm glad <laughs> Loretta is taking over the chairman's chair. We also thank you for your first year on the board and the first year that the policy subcommittee was in effect. And did an outstanding job of keeping that process going. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next would be the Town Center Committee, Rosemary Reed. I have no report on the Town Center Committee at this time. Thank you. Uh, next would be Community Team, Rosemary Reed. Yes, I would like to report that last night there was a training session. Unfortunately, I was unable to make it. I was at a school board meeting. And the next four-hour training session for community team members is on June 29th. Is that a, do you have a time? Uh, well, it's for <coughs> members who are currently on the team who are in training. Okay. Yes, I think it's 4 to 8 p.m., but okay. <laughs> it's four hours. It's a two-session training. Then. Yes. Okay. And uh, that members of the community are in fact invited and there will be an election of new officers at the next meeting. Okay, unfinished business. Uh, school board policies, second reading. Um, that would be, um, do you want to present them? Want me to say? Yes. Uh, Policy IGBHA equivalent instruction and IGCDA post secondary enrollment options and IF curriculum development and adoption. Um, I entertain a motion. Loretta? Do I hear a second? Peter? Second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? 7-0. Uh, the next un unfinished bus business is our mission statement adoption, and I yield to the superintendent. Okay, uh, we've had a fairly long and involved process on this, and uh, the most recent piece has been a workshop we held on the 26th number of people came and expressed uh, concerns about mainly centered around the uh, part of the mission statement that says that academics would be the priority. And I do have, as I mentioned earlier on the communications, a letter from one of our uh, staff members, Celeste Burrish, who was at that meeting and spoke up and tried to, uh, I think, very eloquently express her concerns about looking for my it's the trouble with too much paper. Well, let me tell you what she says, and oh, here it is. This, I think, is a summary of remarks that she made at that meeting, and since most of you or many of you were there, I think I have enough copies to go. If not, why don't you have this? Okay. I also uh, mentioned earlier that I had received a copy of comments, or actually I think it was sent to you, Jan, as chair, uh, from a parent uh, taking a somewhat opposite view. Um, at crux in these two letters is the feelings that people have about setting a mission statement that talks about academics being um, a priority. Uh, 
the art teachers are concerned and other people who not not just the art teachers that that may be too narrow a statement whereas uh, many of the parents who were there as well as um, other staff members feel that setting academics as a priority does not close out other topics but simply gives it a a, um, a position of prominence um, at this point I'm not sure I can come up with any wording that is going to be any different or better in pulling these two ideas together than what we now have I have not as you know single-handedly written the mission statement it has gone through several hands it's gone through several uh, readings by a number of groups it was widely distributed uh, to all staff members it was printed in the courier at least in its draft form uh, we've made some small changes since then um, but my, my sense is that we've done the best we can for now I certainly want to communicate my sense of respect for um, the point of view that the term academics may be seen as an overly narrow point of view I, I do intuitively as well as actually know that when people are talking about learning uh, through holistic methods or learning through uh, the structures of art um, and other non core subjects that that's very valuable learning but I think the purpose of the mission statement is to set a priority and to set a priority that we can live with and actually I have to say if you look at the way we schedule classes uh, every every year every student from kindergarten on is engaged in a um, the use of time that reflects that priority I think the intent of the mission statement is to go beyond just use of time however and say we set as a vision significant learning in those areas that will be attained by everybody um, I'm sure that the art teachers and other related subjects feel that they can make do significant learning for everybody too but I don't know how to express that in some way other than what we have already tried to do I would point out that nothing is carved in concrete this is an attempt a very serious attempt to weigh words and to put forward a mission statement against which we will measure goals and measure implementation and I think it is truly a first step and we'll we will probably understand it better as we work with it but I think schools have to set priorities um, I personally think that we cannot be all things to all people and when I say that I certainly do not want in any way to close out the arts or the way arts will help children see as well as young people grow I value greatly what I see in the buildings and what I see students doing um, so I'm looking at this from a more systemic point of view and a kind of what are the realizable goals of the organization and in that sense and in the sense that we have a time-honored tradition that we follow with the way we schedule time in school anyway I think that reflects our sense so I feel I've done all I can do at this point to bring these points of, of view together but I turned it over to you any comment from the board any comment from Rosemary yes I, I have three Ma'am, I gave my statement to someone as I was walking in um, I just had a question regarding the use of a couple of words and um, on the back page specifically in the first line uh, I would request that the board consider changing the word children to the word students and the second line of the second item on the second page uh, communicate respect for children I would like that to also be um, people excuse me um, students the use of the word children on the first page the way I see it is perfectly acceptable and then uh, the other word I'd like uh, discussion about is in item number one, two, three, four, five, uh, line two. I'll read this sentence. To the extent that a well-rounded education encompasses mind, body, and soul, special attention will be given to sports and to aesthetic enrichment. I would uh, request that the board consider um, exchanging the word athletics for sports uh, in my view athletics is fun in contests and what I've seen with the athletic programs that we have we do in fact deal with uh, wellness physical conditioning discipline and 
many other things. And I don't know how many people would say it's fun. Any comment on those suggested revision? Any other comments? Any comments from the public? The other night, one of our fellow school board members uh, made a comment that I seemed quite quiet that evening, and there was there was an element that he thought that I would pick on pick up on because I seem to be a very moral type person, and I'm going to address that this evening. Um, it has to do with on the second page, the fifth paragraph down, and I need. It, it's, it states, to the extent that a well-rounded education encompasses mind, body, and soul, I need to have soul explained to me. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> um, I think this is uh, one of those statements that came out of a discussion that was more classical in the sense of the sound mind and the sound body. Uh, which goes back, of course, to the Greco-Roman era in the sense of a classical tradition to uh, the underpinnings of what an educated, um, what the goal of education would be. I'm not sure we really got into Plato and Aristotle and so forth, uh, and I don't know that I want to do that, but um, I'm sure that that phrase came out of that kind of discussion. Uh, it was not intended to be religion specific, um, nor is it intended to be anti-religious. Uh, I think one of the things that we did not actually have a statement in here about moral education or ethics, which is another very real concern that was raised in our parent uh, dialogues, um, and appropriately so, uh, I suppose because we believe that there were statements that indicated that um, those kinds of things are very appropriately part of the sweep of an educated man or woman. I'm not sure I'm doing it better than that. No, I was the guilty party, as you <laughs> could tell. Uh, Charlie looked at me. Uh, I, I made the observation that uh, mind and body might be enough, and that the introduction of the concept of a soul as an extension of the mind was a, uh, a religious concept. And. Uh, I was surprised to see it there. Not surprised enough uh, to uh, see anything <laughs> tonight, however. <laughs> but uh, w if one were going to separate church and state very strictly, I think one would simply say mind and body. And that would be my recommendation to strike so. Okay. Anne. I, I think that the person who actually wrote this, <laughs> this little paragraph is not present tonight, but. Um, he is a very able writer, and I, I think it's more of a, it, it was meant more in the poetic sense of the whole person sense rather yeah. than any religious sense. Yes, and I don't mean to put words in his mouth mm. if he's watching, but. But I, I, I would, but I, would not yeah, want I anything see. that yep. would give yep. any connotation of a religious nature. Yep. And that would be my. Seeing no other discussion, uh, entertain a motion to accept or recommend accepting this. Mission statement? Something. And second? Jan? Any further discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Okay. Um. okay. We'll now move on to new business. Yeah. Uh, the first item is personal requests, and I will yield to the superintendent. Okay, um, I'd like to add a, an item to your uh, agenda that I have received since I put this together. Um, I have a letter on resigning a resignation that will be effective at the end of next year. That is a little unusual, but for a variety of reasons, I think it's appropriate for us to, uh, to share it tonight. Um, the letter then is uh, a resignation as teacher of Spanish at Cape Elizabeth Department. It is from Juan Perez Fable. Fable, I'm not sure how I should say that. It's just Fabulous. Fabulous, thank you. Um, I always think of Juan as Juan Perez. The, uh, so it is appropriate for you to act on it now, and I, you can take a separate vote on that or add it to the other personnel 
issues as we go through. If you would like, would you like me to go through all of them? I would prefer to take them as a separate motion. Okay. So that's a, just a resignation versus. Um, right. Assignment. It's a yeah, yes. Exactly. Um, do I entertain a motion, Rosemary? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the resignation of Juan Perez Febles, effective at the end of the school year, 1993. Do I hear a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Um, moving on, the new teaching assignments for the 92 93 school year. And you have a yellow sheet that updates you. Of course, at this time of year, we are continually interviewing and processing so that there is. Uh, opportunity to add the sheet that you have and the positions that you've already been informed about. Lisa Schmidt, grade two, which is the one year position. We included Lisa's resume so you would be able to see, since she's not uh, a teacher that has been on staff with us, uh, she is recently completing her master's in reading at uh, uh, Harvard's Graduate School of Education. She is an experienced teacher um, and we feel that she will be a welcome addition to our staff. Um, the other appointments are from people who have been with us, uh, but who, uh, for a variety of reasons, were in one-year positions or the positions were eliminated, and we are appointing them to new, new positions with this um, vote tonight. Anne-Marie McCann, grade three, Jill Bell, grade four, and Shirley Willis, who has been with us this year as, uh, for the one-year position as director of special ed, is going to stay with us as a special education teacher at the middle school. Um, and so those are the appointments for staff. I also list here a transfer in the sense that it is a teacher already on contract, so you do not have to vote on this. But Gary Record, who has been teaching at Pond Cove, has requested a transfer to grade six. That was one of the new positions we had, and I'm noting that because it is from one building to another, uh, again, not um, you can include that in your vote, but it's not, he is already under contract. You're changing his assignment. The, uh, in addition to that, on your yellow sheet, which just calls it to your attention that this is something you didn't have in your packet, uh, we're asking or uh, expanding time for Wilma Miramontes. Uh, she's been teaching Spanish for us this year at the middle school. Uh, she's going from three tenths to six tenths, and Susan Dana, who also has been teaching this year for us at the middle school, going from five tenths to six tenths. And this is because, you may recall, we reduced Barbara Cannell's time uh, because she wanted to work at the high school only, and um, we needed to cover those classes, and that's how we proposed doing it. In addition, uh, we have been looking for a volunteer coordinator. Uh, you know, of course, that we put a small sum and a modest sum in the budget for that. It's been a fascinating process talking to a number of people who surfaced who were interested in it, and it also clarified uh, my thinking, and I think the thinking of the people who did, went through the interview process with me. It became quickly clear that our funds for that position uh, were so limited that we really could not pull somebody in um, who would have, uh, who could actually set that up in a full-blown way. So we went through a process of trying to decide what was a reasonable assignment, what were the goals we could set for a year uh, for the volunteer coordinator, and uh, also who might bring special skills to that. And ultimately, we, I'm recommending to you Gail Schmader, who has been with us for the last few years, a variety of first volunteer and then some uh, assistant positions. Most notably, she has been involved with the um, integrated arts program, so she already has been doing things that are coordination, and she's uh, expressed quite an interest in this, and I look forward to having her help us in those areas. So, those are my appointments. I entertain a motion. So move. A second. Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Um, the. Final piece under um, uh, teaching positions here is the um, looking at my list of lost track. The additional time for science. Perhaps I don't 
don't know if, if uh, Mr. Jackson wants to say anything about that, but I did give the board a, your memo and memo that uh, people, um, that you and uh, Frank put together, so people have had a chance to read it. It explains that the early in the budget session we had some discussion about whether we could cover uh, putting marine biology back into the course offerings, um, and it first because of the budget situation, I was somewhat reluctant to throw that open. Uh, as the memo explains, we've gone through the arena scheduling. Uh, we did put it on there to see what would happen. It has carried a healthy sign up, and uh, perhaps I'd like to ask uh, Paul to tell you a little bit more about why he wants to support that. Yes, we did try to uh, get marine biology, uh, marine biology back into our program this year, so we put it on on the schedule to see who might sign up. Uh, we knew that some of our other science courses were going to be a little tight, but we thought it was we were going to make it. But what happened, the bottom line is that our uh, CP chemistry uh, just came out overcrowded. We've got uh, too many students for three divisions. We've got to have four divisions of CP chemistry. So what are our options? Our options are to give up the marine biology, which plenty of students have signed up for, or give up one of our other advanced science courses, which I personally feel very strongly about. It's what I think makes our science department what it is, is these advanced offerings. So we're suggesting that uh, we get one-fifth of a science teacher to get us through this problem. And we have just such a teacher in our school that, that could do that by he taking over one of my courses, and I would teach one of the CP uh, chemistry courses. Right, and as the memo explains, it's, it's really not quite a fifth. It's a, uh, it's a class, so that we would be extending Kurt McCandless, who is a teacher on staff, uh, really technically by point two, and that would enable the scheduling to work working it in, and that would make him a full-time teacher. I also want to point out that that doesn't exceed our budget because the high school, uh, and I think you've been responsible for looking at your budget, finding the funds it would take to extend his time to full-time so that we don't tack something onto the whole budget. Yeah, for example, uh, we had uh, budgeted some money for marine biology books. It's kind of a complicated thing. If we don't teach the bi marine biology, we won't need the books. Uh, but in talking with Susan Richmond this week, she's not quite sure what book she wants to use yet anyway. So what I'm saying is there is uh, some money to help out. And then there are some other places that we, we could just, we, we had a, quite a discussion in our science uh, department last week and we decided that you know, we would make do if we could so that we could keep these programs. These funds are coming from your department, correct? Uh, yes, the they are. Part. Okay. So it, it's a team approach to something you feel should be offered? Yes, it is. Okay. Any other question? Rosemary? Yes, I, um, Mr. Jackson, um, based on this letter, I just wanted to um, find out. Uh, we now won't have any uh, students on the waiting list for chemistry. We will, we will not have anyone on the waiting list if we do this. If we do this. So Absolutely. this helps the chemistry students who are in the wings as well as the students from marine biology? Yes. In one division, we had about 10 people on the waiting list, and we're adding that extra class during that same period. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, um, I would entertain a motion. Rosemary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the um, high school's uh, request for additional staffing for the science department. A second. Loretta, any further comment? All those in favor? 7-0. I think that is an interesting example of teamwork, that the, the group itself decided that this was an important objective, and I'm glad we were able to arrive at a positive answer. And my final um, uh, 
personnel issue nominations for administrative contracts for the 1992-93 school year. You have a list in your, your packet. Frank Miles, high school principal, Rick DeFusco, high school assistant principal, Nancy Hutton, middle school principal, Phil Jewett, middle school assistant principal, Beth Anderson, Pond Cove principal, Nancy St. John, Pond Cove assistant principal, Keith Weatherby, athletic director, and Wayne Doerr, director of special education, who of course was, his position was filled this year by Shirley Willis. In addition, uh, non-building principals or non-school administrative staff, but we are responsible for the uh, appointment of administrators at Community Services. So also on the list are Sue Weatherby, Director of Community <laughs> Services, and Janet Hoskin, Assistant Director of Community Services. Rose, um, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations of administrative contracts for the 1992-93 school year. Do I hear a second? Second. Peter, any discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. The last uh, item on our new business agenda is D, appointment of C, school board policies, first reading, and I'm going to yield to the chairman of the policy subcommittee. Um, the policy for first reading is uh, IHP class size, and I'd, I'd just like to point one thing out. One thing in the in the memo about the chemistry sections, there's a there's a reference in here to using nine or fewer as the guideline for considering cutting sections, and in this policy, we're saying that the minimum is ten. Is that an issue? <laughs> No, no, it's not. When, 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 we, when we see 10, we keep it. When we see 9, we, we ask some serious questions. You'll note that there are, at the moment, there are some science courses with fewer than 10. Um, we feel it's important in, in the short run while our school population is, is at, the, at that low state to keep it there for advanced science courses. But by and large, we get a low enrollment. We, we, we either combine sections, which is what we prefer to do when we know about it in advance, or we simply don't offer the course. We have to have some some Right, practice. right. Well, the one reason I was even bringing it up was that the policy before did not state what the minimum size was, and we put in mm -hmm. of 10 in the school board policy. That, that so would be, just, yeah. we would be comfortable with that. So that was the only change that you're suggesting? And we took out, we took out pre-K. Pre yeah and change the word attitudes to input, input of the teachers? Um, the preschool program, is there a class size? Well, that one is, is uh, supported by parent um, fees and, of course, run in the high school. Originally, that was conceived as a, a program that was directly tied to um, high, school, high school curriculum. I think it, the character and nature of that connection has changed somewhat over the years. But uh, frankly, the size is, is geared to any uh, recommendations for children that age, plus the fee schedule. I, so it's not really, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's in an interesting situation with our programs. Um, it's a privately supported program in a way for the most part. Except that the space, of course, is we don't rent space out to a private nursery school. And it was, as I said, I know when I was in the system 20 years ago, I know what the concept of that program was, which has somewhat changed, but essentially stayed the same, uh, to involve a nursery school program with high school students working in there as aides. Um, so I don't believe that that preschool program belongs on our class size list. There are factors there that limit it, aside from any policy level decisions. The only reason I raised it is it is a, con a teacher contracted position, and that was the only reason I raised it. I, that's true, but I think that the, um, that's a, historically, you see, a contract that was issued to somebody who was seen as being part of the high school staff. And the program had a strong connection to uh, to the high school, not necessarily a home ec program, but that there was that sense that it was a um, a program that belonged in the high school, so that uh, young people would have some contact with children and work as 
as aides and tutors. You were there too, Paul. Am I misstating that at the time? I think so. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's how we got into a situation because we're running the program at the high school. I mean, I think it's really important to note that that program has not been run even when there was space at Pond Cove. It's always been run at the high school. And that's where the teacher became a part of the, although I don't know how much uh, the current teacher regards herself a member of the high school faculty, but I think she has connections, doesn't she, Frank? She regards herself as a member of the faculty and we regard her as such. That program is supported by the tuition paid by the nursery school students, so her salary the, all the expenses of that program are paid for by the by the, uh, the nursery school students, and she works with 20 to 25 high school students who work in her classroom each day with the nursery school children. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I since we're updating language, if not uh, policy, I the reference to uh, industrial arts and home economics I think is outdated. And I would uh, suggest the uh, change of those two lines, which include practical arts to laboratory situations, if that covers it, if that's an acceptable situation. I'm not sure what, uh, Frank, what about lab classes at the high school? What, is there any attempt to keep those in different from the, the class size, the non-lab part of the class? Um. In, in science, the, the lab size we strive for is 20. In technology, with power equipment, I think there's a state-mandated minimum of 15, or maximum, excuse me, I don't mean minimum. Um, and I think we, we adhere as closely as we can to that. So technology now, given changes of courses, uh, what you're, you're suggesting is 15, it used to be 16. Well, right? well 15. 16, uh, I may have the wrong number. I think we have to be careful whether we talk about technology, meaning a drafting class, which can have 20, right. 20 students in it, or a graphic arts class, or we're talking about power equipment such as welders or table saws where we want a different level of, of monitoring. I put those in the category of labs, that's why I use that. Yeah, I, I think technology lab hour is different than, say, a chemistry lab where we think of 20, which is one of, was one of our concerns with the, with the uh, science. Well, I, dealt with. I'm not attached to that word necessarily. I, I just don't think practical arts, industrial arts, and home economics is an appropriate phrase. Well, why, why don't we just take that whole, whole phrase out? Because on the, on the next page, it says, if any elementary or secondary school class exceeds the, and this is another addition, state maximum size, we'll consult, blah, blah, blah. And that, that would cover every conceivable class. Well, I just had a question on the preschool thing. Do, do we always charge right from the beginning for preschool, do you know? I don't remember. Paul, do you remember? I don't have any real reflection on it. Because you, you, you might want to check. A citizen said to me that they thought, that she thought we were not in compliance with the state to use it as a training school and still charge children to come there. I will certainly, you know, look into that because I don't, I really don't know. I just know that, um, that the original concept of that was pretty much has been stated here tonight and where and when and what the history of fee charging is, I really don't know, but I can find it. This is a first reading, so we'll revisit this again at our next meeting. Um, I entertain a motion to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations. I move we enter executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations. A second. Rosemary, all those in favor? 7-0.